Here we are at video 8 of the OWASP Top 10 2017 and in this new entry we're going to be looking at something called insecure deserialization. Now this is a new entry and it came from the community so what OWASP decided was uh, perhaps just having information taken directly from testing companies might give a, a slightly biased view of what, um, what life is like and what applications are really like but also results from testing don't necessarily proactively consider risks that are appearing now as people are changing the way that they're building applications so they went out to the community and said right guys if you've got ideas for things which you think are a big risk which are either happening more and more or which for some reason are not being picked up on tests then please submit those and this was one of those entries so this is the grid for insecure deserialization. We're saying something that's generally pretty hard to exploit, but at the same time, it's uh, perhaps fairly common and it's reasonably easy to detect in some cases. But the real kind of point here is that the technical impact of a successful deserialization attack could be very severe depending on the actual application and what it does. You could potentially run code on the target server you could certainly raise your privileges for a certain user and perhaps gain access to parts of the application that you shouldn't have access to so really ultimately you you could potentially do anything with a successful attack depending on the application and obviously the business impact of that depends very much on what your application is and what it does so here we're really talking about a blanket term, a very top level term for any attack on a serialized object. And we'll look at kind of an example in a minute, but really we're talking about something that's quite kind of fluffy because it exists in, you know, across many different places and many different technologies and many different types. So it's quite hard to be very specific about this, but we're really talking about any data object that gets serialized, usually to text, but not necessarily. It could be serialized to binary. And then that object being tampered with in some way to give the attacker an advantage that when that object then gets deserialized at the other end, it's going to be uh, misidentified or it's going to contain things it shouldn't contain. And that's basically the, the way the exploit works. And the issue here is since objects are, are pretty much used for anything right across your app from the, you know, the very start of the browser request, right through to the application to caching to databases etc it really covers you know everything and anything potentially although in reality each individual application is likely to only use it in one or two areas it could potentially be anywhere and any time that an object can be changed without that change being detected by the system and rejected then there is obviously some kind of risk the risk might just be a crash but that's still pretty important for den denial of service reasons but obviously in worst case if that object is effectively a command and that command is modified to do something that the attacker wants it to do then you could be running code you could be gaining system access and all kinds of stuff so uh, this this is really what we're talking about in a nutshell so this is an example imagine you have a web service that's connected to your kind of role based authorization control and you have a web application that sends a command to this web service to say give user Alice the role admin and maybe it's effective from today whatever and this is effectively an object but it gets serialized to make it easier to send over the wire to the web service so this might be a JSON object it could just be some kind of text serializer or maybe this is just a text representation of a binary object the the basic concept doesn't really care about that so imagine you send this and this gives Alice the role of admin and at the moment this clearly has no particular protections against tampering or anything like that now imagine that there was some way and again this is very general it could be on the network it could be doing something on the application it could be doing something at the web service end it could be a number of, of different attack vectors but imagine our attacker Mallory gets hold of this object while it's in flight and changes it to be user Mallory given the role of admin 
And clearly here, by having no particular checks on this object, the web service is going to see this and probably it's going to say, OK, the user Mallory can now have admin access and uh, the the defender might not even know this has happened. They might wonder why Alice doesn't have the role and maybe they'll run it again and, and then Alice will get it again uh, and it will all be fine. But this is, you know, potentially an invisible attack. Obviously, in some cases, it wouldn't be invisible, but actually trying to track down what's happened here and how it happened and everything could be very, very complicated because, as I say, it could happen at any part of the stack in many and lots of different systems. So in terms of how common it is, again, it's going to depend very much on your application. In some applications, it won't exist at all because you don't expose any serialized objects anywhere where they're likely to be accessed. But bear in mind that even if your application treats things properly, if you're storing things, say, on the file system or in a cache, then if the cache or the file system is compromised, then you're still vulnerable, even if your application itself is not vulnerable. So remember, you, you don't attack everything necessarily via the web application. It could be attacked via the file system, via another vulnerable web server, perhaps via an SSH vulnerability. So it's not necessarily your application that is at fault in terms of the original tampering, which is why your application needs to consider where it gets its objects from and then make sure that they're de deserialized in a safe way. So we're talking here potentially about remote procedure calls or inter-process communication. So anywhere where two systems are talking to each other using serialized commands and data data objects. We're talking about things like web services and APIs, which is kind of the same thing, but perhaps exposed on the public internet. Any type of caching or object storage, if uh, again, if the, the caching system itself gets compromised and somebody is able to change those objects in cache, then you're going to potentially have the same vulnerability. Databases and file systems, again, we tend to assume that they're safe. But, you know, what if somebody did somehow change the data in a database? What if they broke into the payroll database and changed the value of their salary? Is your system going to be able to detect that or is it just going to pay them more money than they should be, be getting paid? So there's a, some more perhaps subtle ways that this might happen, which you should consider uh, in your application. And the other place that's sometimes relevant, although perhaps more on older web applications, uh, are cookies. So if you use cookies too much then obviously that's effectively just a text file. So that can be modified at the browser end and can be sent back modified. So if that doesn't have any controls or if it, it carries with it too much authority to do things, then obviously you're going to be vulnerable there. Uh, form, HTML forms, any kind of tokens, auth tokens, things like that. They're often kind of transparent handles, or they should be anyway. They shouldn't have any intrinsic meaning. But, you know, there have been plenty of cases, certainly in the past, where people do something like take a load of data, base64, encode it, and think that just because it looks like random data that an attacker isn't going to guess what it is, modify it, and, you know, and gain some kind of advantage. So, again, it kind of exists everywhere. You're going to have to consider anywhere where you're dumping objects, raw objects, to any kind of external system. So I can't really give you much by way of a very useful example, but if I go to my web application, so I've created a web forms application in .NET. This is just an example. It doesn't matter if you um, understand, if you don't understand .NET or not. But if I run this up, this is uh, just an application out of the box. It, I haven't changed it apart from adding my kind of decryption code here. Uh, Firefox is installing updates, which is very useful. And when the page opens, then eventually, then this should be, I think it'll be logged in as me. Okay, so, okay, it's not logged in at the minute, which is fine. So at the moment, if I bring up the developer tools and I look here at storage, you'll see that there is a consent cookie for consenting to cookies being dropped and as with any um, page that posts a form it has an anti cross-site request forgery token there as well but at the minute there isn't any auth cookie so nothing particularly interesting at the minute so what i'm going to do is i'm going to log in and i'm going to log in with just this example okay type that wrong <laughs> 
and I'm going to log in now. Don't save. Now, what, what I've done here is I've taken the contents of the auth cookie and I've decrypted it. So this is what this code is doing. It doesn't matter too much what it's doing and how it's doing it. It will be different for every uh, every system. But if I open up the claims here, I can see the actual contents of the cookie includes my email address, the type of identity provider, which in this case is the built-in ASP.NET one, um, like a unique identifier and stuff like that. So if I just carry on, you'll notice here that it's printing my email address here, but effectively it only knows that email address because of this cookie that's now been dropped, which is called the application cookie. So this is a, a .NET thing. But this really is uh, an XML document that includes a number of claims that then gets encrypted, signed, compressed, and put into a cookie. So this is a, you know, a relatively long string of Base64 encoded data. But if this wasn't protected, this would be an example of somewhere where an attacker might be able to Base64 decode it and go, oh, that's got Luke at example.com in it. Let's change that to be Mallory at example.com or let's change my one to somebody else's one so I can gain access to somebody else's account. Because the only way that the system knows who's logged in is by reading this cookie when it comes into the server, decrypting it, seeing the identity, maybe the unique identity, depending on how it works, and then getting that information about the user from the database. So if I was able to decrypt this on the client without having access to the server, and this would be true for any auth system, then I would be able to log in as anybody else. So that's the, the kind of the vulnerability that exists. But here, as in most good frameworks, there's protection on this. Uh, and in fact, in the code, I have to use a built-in function, which basically unprotects the bytes of, um, of this cookie to make sure that I could read it. And it uses the uh, a machine key, which is, in this case, is generated automatically if I don't specify one. But I can also specify one in my configuration if I want. So this is a protected cookie. But if that wasn't, I mean, if that was, well, even here, things like yes, if that was a, an important cookie, well, I can edit these and I can change it to no and send it back again. And if that gets me some kind of benefit as an attacker, then that is a very simple object serialization vulnerability. So that's kind of, kind of an example. I mean, I could show you um, lots of different things, but they're all a little bit specific to individual applications. So there's probably no particular useful example. And hopefully what an attacker is trying to do is fairly obvious. They've got an object that's been serialized with data or a command and they're trying to modify that to get some kind of advantage. So hopefully the concept is fairly easy to understand. Now, in terms of fixing it, we've got kind of some of the, the recurring themes here. Obviously, the first one is always avoid stuff if you don't need to do it. So serialization is always potentially a vulnerability, a little bit like taking user input and stuff like that. So if you don't need it, don't do it. And that might be possible. It might not. As with pretty much all of these, they're not always possible for you to do. And that might be because you need the functionality that it presents. Or it might be that you don't have access to all the parts of your application or the ability to modify it. So you may or may not be able to do some of these. But avoiding serialization, if, if you're, you know, you possibly will need to do it in some places. But, you know, if you can reduce that as much as possible, you obviously reduce your attack surface. And then the next one, again, it's kind of a recurring theme. Do your research. If you're trying to do something, so imagine you're trying to store an object into something like a Redis cache. Well, that's a very well-known pattern because people do it all the time. So if you're kind of asking the question, how do I securely store objects in Redis? there's a very good chance that you'll find the answer on the web somewhere because somebody would have already done it. And, and the answer might be it's already built in. The answer might be there's a library in .NET or Python or Ruby or whatever. The answer might be you must do this and you must not do this. So you need to do your research, do your homework and find out uh, the best way to do it. Be very careful about inventing your own stuff because there are plenty of places where you might do something that seems clever but actually it's either not as secure as you think or sometimes not secure at all. 
I mean, for example, that ex the idea of somebody base 64 encoding something and thinking that because it looks random, that makes it random. And of course, people will know that that's not the case. The third thing is, again, might or might not be possible, avoid allowing objects from untrusted sources. So in some cases, this should be the default, because in most cases, we shouldn't be taking any kind of serialized object from an untrusted source. But again, there's a very good chance that if you have a specialized application, it might well be consuming data from a source that you don't have direct control of. Maybe it's semi-trusted. Maybe it's from another department in the same company. But maybe you don't have the knowledge that everything is definitely legit that appears in that data source. But if again, if you can avoid that, then having a trusted source leads us to the fourth item, which is using signatures to avoid tampering. Now, the problem with signatures is they only work if you can hide the uh, secret a pre-shared key which is used to derive the signature if you have a public service let's say you have a front-end web application that produces an object and then signs it that's pretty much not going to be any use in terms of security because an attacker can see how you sign it and then they can tamper with the object re-sign it and send the whole object and it would still be valid even though uh, it's been tampered with. So signatures work when you trust both sides and you've got a way of hiding a pre-shared key, effectively a secret, and then you can put that into signing algorithms like you know HMAC and stuff like that, which then provides you a nice big hash number, which makes tampering largely impossible or unfeasible, should we say. So that's pretty good. Um, in general, you should use encryption in transit. So obviously some of the ways that an attacker can attack your data, it's when it's moving from point A to point B. So if you're using any kind of insecure network at any point, then somebody could effectively tamper with the data. Obviously, if you're using things like HTTPS or equivalent transport layer security, then that's going to prevent a lot of ability of an attacker to tamper uh, anywhere between the source and the, the destination of that data. If you're talking about things like web services, things like um, WCF services in .NET, for example, they provide various built-in mechanisms to enable you to use things like transport layer security just by flicking a switch and, and adding a certificate to it. So you, know, you need to consider those sorts of things, as you should do in terms of static data as well. So you can use encryption on objects stored in things like Redis, but you again need to understand what you're doing so you don't use unnecessary encryption that might not add any benefit but might slow down your system but also you know just making sure that you're not doing something that actually makes the data weaker uh, than it than you're trying to make it another way to protect deserialization which again it's not going to be perfect but you can use a whitelisting mechanism um, of expected types of data. So imagine in our example earlier when Mallory tries to change um, Alice to Mallory or does change Alice to Mallory, there might be a way that you can have business rules that says, hang on a sec, Mallory isn't a user in the IT department, therefore that is not a valid value for the user. So you could obviously have lots of various different business logic to say, you know, they're trying to set a salary of 200,000 and that isn't a valid salary because nobody gets paid more than 150,000. So you could do things like that. Obviously, that's never going to be perfect because what if somebody puts their salary up from 50 to 100,000? Then maybe there's there's no obvious way you could detect to that. But, you know, you can use one of the further down items. You can use login to maybe flag um, privileged operations that you don't expect to happen very often. Maybe just to say to somebody, do you know that this person is changing their salary? So whitelisting can help, but that's kind of a bit of a low priority because it's because it isn't perfect and because there's always going to be things that are, that are going to get through that checking if you're using objects to actually convey a command or an operation, then deserializing an object in some kind of sandboxed environment is quite important. Um, one example of this is not, not directly the same, but an example I can think of is we used to use a library called Image Resizer in .NET. So somebody uploads an image in a web application 
and then using imagery sizer we make sure it comes down to a sensible size so we're not storing massive images on the server but of course then the question arises well what happens if somebody uploads an image that has a virus in it we don't really want to be running that in the same memory space as a web application even though the library might not do anything bad then it's a bit of a risk so actually the a way of fixing that is we set up an image processing server and all that server does is takes the images resizes them and then sends them in the background to the the web server and that allows the deserialization to take place somewhere where that virus can't um, create such a, a serious problem another one this is kind of not so much how to fix it but this is a, a reactionary measure is you know logging for things that happen that are unexpected so if you use things like signatures and a signature fails you probably want to know that and you want the the object that's attempted to be deserialized obviously it might be something unrelated like a broken network connection has dropped half of the object but of course if you see something that looks like an attack that might be important for you to say right how might this be happening do we know who's doing this is there a way we can block it is there a way we can improve the system to actually stop this happening in the first place so as with all logging advice you have to balance how much you log with you know losing the the good information amongst all of the noise but you know logins really quite quite a powerful tool if you use it well and in terms of actually practically you know put a question on the code review checklist if somebody adds new code ask the question is this doing serialization or deserialization and if the answer is yes have you considered how this is protected from tampering um, in transit or at rest and again the answer might not always be obvious but at least you've got the ability there to pause and say right have we thought about this don't just put it in there wait for it to fall over have somebody you know pull your system down and then go oh we should have thought about deserialization afterwards just put the question in there ask the question if you can't answer it then obviously you've got a different kind of problem but that's kind of all I've really got to say about this. It's a relatively quick subject, I think, because the the risk is fairly well. It should be fairly easy to understand. The ways in which we stop it happening should be fairly easy to understand. But at the same time, it's a very broad subject and covers many different types of technology. So we can't give too many specifics. Like using signatures is great, but that's going to work differently depending on what you're doing. Encryption is going to work differently depending on what you're doing. So unfortunately, we can't give you too many specifics. But if you have any questions or comments about this please just put them put them below the video and i'll try and help you out but otherwise please read the top 10 publication it's there at owasp.org and that's got all of the the data that you've seen in this presentation plus links to helpful resources cheat sheets more explanations and please just keep writing secure software i'll see you in the next video